right now? Let's try. Yes. So we're talking about what is spiritual perfection in the current age. And first we would like to ask, well, what, what is perfection? What do we mean by attaining perfection? So for this, we look at the Bhagavad Gita. And in chapter 6, Krishna defines perfection as being able to see the self by the pure mind. So generally, what we think of as the self is the body. Right? You think, this is, this is myself. But a little introspection, we'd understand that this body is not our self. After all, when we were very small, we had a tiny baby body. And if we put photographs of that, those baby bodies on the wall, and we said, now match those pictures to the present bodies, we wouldn't be able to do that very well, correct? Our bodies completely changed. Not like a balloon that just got bigger, you know, we have a different body. But yet we're the same person. Maybe we can remember something from when we were four or five years old. Okay? So we can understand that the body cannot be me. Huh? The body cannot be me. And sometimes a person has a disease or accident, they lose an arm, they lose a leg, but they're still the same person. So to see the self means to see the spiritual self by the pure mind. So the mind that's not contaminated by the modes of nature, the mind that's not contaminated by selfishness and egoism. And then we see the actual self, which is a spiritual being, transcendental to this body. And Krishna also says that perfection is to relish and rejoice in the self. So when we think that we are this body, or even that we are this mind, it is very difficult to love ourselves. It's become very popular nowadays for people to talk about loving yourself, right? I'm sure everybody's heard that, you should love yourself. Sometimes people say you can't love anybody else until you've loved yourself. Yes? But if we're going to identify the self as the body, it's very hard to love ourself in terms of the body. Again, there's a lot of propaganda like that. You know, everyone's body is beautiful. But that's not objectively a fact. If it was objectively a fact, then the whole cosmetic and plastic surgery industry would be bankrupt. <laughs> and much of the fashion industry. Uh, most of us find something about our body we don't like. Our nose is too small or too big, or our hair is too curly or too straight, or we're not tall enough, or we're too tall, or we're too fat over here, or too skinny over there, isn't it? Anybody look in the body, look in the mirror and go, oh, my body's absolutely perfect. It, it's hard to love yourself if you think that you're the body, and it's hard to love yourself if you think that you're the mind. Right? Our mind has so many uh, thoughts that we don't like. Isn't this true? I don't think any of us would like to take all of our thoughts in a day and make them public. <laughs> so how do we love ourselves if we think that we're the mind? But Krishna says we relish and rejoice in the self. Not only that we love ourselves, we relish and rejoice in the self. And that is when we understand that we are a spiritual being. As a spiritual being, we're part of Krishna, Mamai Vamso Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. And just like Krishna, we are perfect. We are not infinite like Krishna, but we are perfect like Krishna. We have most of the qualities of God. And we are, we are wonderful. <laughs> so perfection is when we can really rejoice in ourselves because we see ourselves. We experience ourselves. And Krishna also says perfection is having boundless transcendental happiness realized through transcendental senses. So our happiness in this world, materially, is not boundless. We eat some good food or have some uh, romantic encounter with our spouse, but that has a boundary to it. We go to Disneyland or whatever somebody may find enjoyable. They watch a fun movie or they... Uh, walk in the woods, whatever people find to be happy, but it has some 
boundary on it. The walk in the woods is over, the movie is over, the romantic encounter is over, the pizza is over. And even when one is enjoying it, it's still not unlimited happiness. It's limited in quantity, it's limited in quality, and the more we try to repeat the same experience, it gets boring. If you eat pizza for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner and for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner, and you know, after a few days, you I don't want to see any more pizza. So happiness based on the senses and the mind is not boundless. So Krishna is saying perfection is you have boundless happiness, happiness that doesn't have a boundary of quality or quantity. And this is only experienced through spiritual senses. We cannot experience boundless happiness just through our fleshy eyes and ears and nose. But the senses of the soul can experience boundless happiness. Why is that? Because we're in connection with Krishna, who is boundless. Advaita Machuta Manari Mananta Rupam. His form is unlimited. And it's unlimited bliss. And when we are in touch with him, we feel unlimited happiness. Krishna also says perfection is never departing from the truth. So uh, materially, sometimes we see things the way they are, and other times we don't. Sometimes we're in truth, and sometimes we're not in truth. Right? We make mistakes. We say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing, and then we're embarrassed, and we apologize, and we try to fix it. Yes, we don't always perceive things clearly. We often perceive things according to our ego, or according to how our parents raised us, or according to our particular culture or time, rather than to see things in truth. But perfection is one always sees things as they are. There's not any distortion. There's no distortion of ego. There's no distortion according to our particular culture. Everything is seen all the time in truth. Krishna also explains that perfection means that one feels, I have the best thing. There's nothing better than this. Now, we might feel that way very temporarily, materially. You know, maybe you get a new car, and you think, wow, this is the best car. <laughs> but very quickly, your car gets a scratch, it gets a bump, it's not the best car anymore. Or your neighbor gets a little bit better car, right? And you see a little better car in an advertisement. Oh, I should have got that one. Ah, oh, I just got this computer. Oh, now there's a better computer. One friend told me that, yeah, I got a phone, it was, you know, number nine, but now they have number 12. Now they produce phone number 12, and I only have phone number nine. So materially, we feel we get the best thing, and then very quickly, we feel it's not the best thing. But perfection is when one feels subjectively, I have the best thing. And one always feels, I have the best thing. And perfection also, Krishna says, means never being shaken even in the midst of the greatest difficulty. This concept is interesting because Krishna does not say that perfection means you have no difficulty. I think many people feel that if you're a religious person or if you're a spiritual person, you shouldn't have any problems in life. You should never get sick. You should never get hurt. Nobody should ever insult you. You should never lose any money. But that's not the promise given of perfection. The promise given of perfection is that no matter how great the difficulty, somebody tells lies about you, ruins your reputation, you lose your job, you lose all your money, your house burns down, your spouse leaves you, your children all turn out bad and end up in prison, you know, and then you get in a car accident, lose your memory, and you end up in, you know, the ICU. I mean, you know, like, that's like the worst, what's the worst thing we can imagine, you know? There's a war, we're captured, we're in a POW camp. But one's not shaken. One's not affected. And we have so many examples in history and in the scripture of people who are unaffected even by great difficulty. Haridas Thakur, who although he was a Muslim, was chanting Hare Krishna. And because of that, the Muslim government 
basically tried to execute him. And they were beating him through 23 different villages. And still he wasn't disturbed. He didn't feel any pain. He didn't feel any mental disturbance. He wasn't shaken. It didn't affect him. Because he knew this has nothing to do with me. Uh, one is situated on the platform of spiritual identity. And ultimately, this spiritual perfection means that we have our loving relationship with the Lord. Spiritual perfection is not something impersonal or voidist. It's not just like, oh, I'm not shaken by any difficulty. I'm spiritual. Because that's also boring. Boundless transcendental happiness experienced through transcendental senses implies that one is using one's spiritual senses in a relationship with Krishna. One is not just simply in some sort of impersonal state. So our understanding of perfection from the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, is that our original relationship with Krishna is revived. And we understand, I deal with Krishna in this particular way. So how do we achieve this perfection? So the main way that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that we can achieve all of these items of perfection is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, either quietly uh, to ourselves with beads and japa, or in a group with kirtan, with musical instruments, and so forth. So we might wonder, how is this the key to perfection? How is it that chanting the Hare Krishna mantra will give us all these items of perfection? Because after all, there's different kinds of yoga. So we have on the book table, one of our books is The Essence Seekers, which is a, a novel of how one progresses from materialistic life to perfection. And within Essence Seekers, we have a section where we detail the different kinds of yoga, karma yoga, gyan yoga, dhyan yoga, bhakti yoga. And one may wonder, uh, why chanting Hare Krishna? Why not sitting and meditating? And uh, the other day I was in Laguna Beach, and one gentleman at the Sunday feast was saying, yes, I'm in Kund I practice kundalini yoga. You know, well, why not that? Uh, or why not just... Uh, you know, giving in charity, feeding the poor, right? developing a vaccine for the coronavirus. <laughs> Why not that is a way to, to become perfect? Why chanting Hare Krishna? So we're going to look at Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Shikshastika. Shikshastika means eight verses of instruction. And we're going to look tonight just at the first verse of the Shikshastika where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes the qualities of the holy name and helps us to understand why, by chanting the holy name, we will achieve all of these perfections. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the different parts of the first verse of the Shikshastika and meditate on each part, and then we're going to uh, listen to that verse. So the first point that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu makes is that the holy name will cleanse the mirror of the heart. So you remember that one part of perfection is to see the self by the pure mind, yes? To not see the self in terms of the body or the mind, but to see the spiritual self with a pure mind. So this implies that there's some sort of mirror, there's some sort of means internally by which we understand who we are. Just like we can have an external mirror that we look into and we can see the eyes and nose and hair of this body. There's internally our sense of who we are. I think all of us are aware of that. We have some internal self-concept. I'm this kind of person. I look like this. I act like this. I, you know, have this political belief, this religious belief, this philosophical belief. I have this particular kind of personality and nature. I come from this country, this family. So these self-ideas act as a mirror by which we understand who we are. But if this mirror is dirty, we don't see ourselves clearly. 
Or I'm sure you've seen some mirrors that are distorted, sometimes in an amusement park. They have mirrors that make you look very tall and thin or very fat or, or you know, stretch out in different ways. So if the mirror is distorted or if the mirror is dirty, when one goes to try to understand oneself, one will see something that's distorted. Now, what is this dirt on the mirror of the inner consciousness? This dirt on the mirror of the inner consciousness is a sense of being separated from Krishna. Krishna defines illusion in this way in the Bhagavatam. He says, if you think something has value, but you see it separate from me, then that is my illusory energy. It's a reflection. He also uses this word reflection. It's a reflection that appears to be in darkness. So as soon as we don't see, remember we were talking about perfection as our, having our relationship with Krishna, as soon as we don't understand that I have a loving relationship with Krishna, then immediately my reflection goes into darkness. And we can understand this by a material example. So sometimes you have a child who becomes very rebellious. I remember I was, I don't know, maybe nine or ten years old, and I became very angry at my mother about something, which, of course, at the time was very important, but I can no longer remember what it was. But I became extremely angry, and I decided that I was going to run away from home. So I wrote a note, Dear Mom, don't look for me. I have run away from home. But don't worry, I'll be back later. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a child becomes very rebellious. Correct? And they forget their relationship with their family. They forget their obligation to their parents, to their siblings, to their elders in their family. And they may commit crimes or they may get into some sort of trouble and be irresponsible. We all know of some family where this has happened. You know, the children are in jail or some other problem. And as soon as the child forgets their relationship with the family, then they lose their sense of identity. They lose their, their sense of dharma. They lose their sense of responsibility. So this is very easy to understand from a mundane example. Or a person working at a job. If they forget their relationship with their employer, then they may steal from the job, or they may not do their work properly. They, they lose their sense of identity. So as soon as we don't see ourselves in relationship to Krishna, who's everywhere and everything, and our Supreme Father, then we also lose our sense of who we are. And because who I am is a part of Krishna and a spiritual being, it's actually quite serious that I start seeing myself, as we were talking about earlier, as this very flawed body and mind. It's, it's actually quite an unfortunate situation where I'm this beautiful, powerful, youthful, intelligent, compassionate, spiritual being, and instead I see myself as a bunch of bones and flesh and muscles and intestines and eyeballs and hair and, you know, like that. It is actually quite unfortunate. So the way that the inner mirror of the consciousness becomes cleaned is that, again, I have a relationship with Krishna because my identity is always in relationship to Krishna. So when I chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, then I am associating with Krishna and I am, as soon as I chant, I am immediately reestablishing that relationship. So immediately it starts to clean this mirror. And we talked a little bit yesterday in studying Parama Koruna about the concept of Kevala Nanda Kanda that Krishna consciousness is simply joyful. And we brought up the point that it may not always seem joyful to become aware of our inartis, to become aware of our contaminations. So part of what happens with chanting the holy name, when we start cleaning this mirror of the consciousness and seeing ourselves accurately, is not only do we see that we are a spiritual, beautiful, happy uh, being, but we also see how due to our foolishness, we have contaminated ourselves with Maya. We see both of those aspects. We, we become aware of how we have hurt ourselves and hurt our relationship with the Lord. 
And one can say that that's a painful thing. If we see that outside of a relationship with Krishna, it's certainly painful. But if we see it as part of developing our relationship with Krishna, it is also joyful because it's a very integral part of reestablishing that relationship. And a way to understand this is, I'm sure there's someone in our life who has offended us in some way, or insulted us, or betrayed us, or cheated us in some way, yes? Maybe it was a minor thing, maybe it was just some shopkeeper who you know, gave you a bad deal, or maybe it's someone that you really trusted. And if that person wants to reestablish their relationship, then part of doing that is they need to admit what they've done wrong. Am I correct? Yeah? I mean, if someone's really hurt us, you know, if somebody was a guest at my house and they stole my computer. You know, I, I read a, a true story about a, a woman who was staying at her friend's house and asked to borrow her very expensive purse, some like Louis Vuitton or Gucci or one of these things. And she said, sure, you can borrow it. So she brought it back after a day and then the friend left and a week later the purse broke. So the owner took it in to get repaired and the repair shop said, this is a fake. So the woman could immediately understand, my friend took my expensive purse and substituted a fake. And when she confronted her friend, her friend said, oh, sorry, but I needed the money. Right? So that's not going to restore the relationship, is it? Because the person's not acknowledging how they betrayed the trust of their friend. Everybody can follow this? I'm sure we've had that example. You know, somebody apologizes to us. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, you weren't very nice to me either. And we're like, ah, uh, it doesn't really work for me. And when somebody apologizes genuinely and really restores the relationship, it's very pleasurable. And in fact, sometimes restored relationships are stronger and sweeter than ones that weren't ever tested. In fact, it's quite interesting. Businesses find that people are the most loyal customers when the company messes up and then fixes it over people who had experience when the company never messed up. If the company never messes up, you may take it for granted, right? But if they mess up and then they fix it, they, oh, what a nice company. So sometimes a relationship that's broken and restored is a more blissful relationship. So we have offended Krishna. This is sometimes a hard thing to understand, but we have offended Krishna. And part of restoring our relationship with Krishna is to be able to clearly see how we are offending Krishna so that we can have some genuine remorse. And if that genuine remorse is part of reestablishing the relationship, it's very sweet. Again, I'm sure we've all had an experience of how sweet it is to restore a relationship through apology, either someone apologizing to us or us apologizing to someone else. So this cleansing the mirror of the mind is like that. We see our spiritual glory, we see our spiritual beauty, our spiritual knowledge, and we also understand uh, of our offense, how we have betrayed Krishna, how we have turned against Krishna. And we have the opportunity then to come to him with repentance and with remorse. And so those things go together, become very, very sweet. So we can understand how as soon as we connect with Krishna by chanting his holy name, then we are in that process of reviving our relationship and therefore these things become very clear. Just like if, if I've offended, they say, um, you know, the other day when you did this and that, and things become clear. So this is exactly what happens when we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Also, Mahaprabhu says that the Hare Krishna mantra puts out the fire of materialistic life. So Krishna tells Arjuna that our material lust, and by lust we don't just mean sexual lust, but we mean any kind of overwhelming desire to enjoy in this world such that we become blinded to the consequences of that desire. And Krishna says that this intense desire for things in this world, and we, again, we don't even just mean things, 
we may mean a position, respect, and so forth, that it burns like fire. And I'm sure we've experienced this, that whenever we have some intense desire in this world, whether it's you know to have a relationship with a person, whether it's to buy some item, uh, whether it's to live someplace, to have a particular job, to have particular recognition, it, it becomes a very intense thing. Now, I wonder if this will work. We're going to see. No, it didn't work. OK, can you try clicking on the picture? There you go. So Krishna uh, has some pastimes where he swallows a fire. There are two pastimes where uh, Krishna is swallowing a fire. Once is after Krishna danced on the heads of Kaliya Nag. So then there is where everybody, everyone was so exhausted from the whole ordeal with this Kaliya serpent that they were sleeping on the bank of the Yamuna. And then when they were sleeping, a fire came and Krishna swallowed that fire. And in another pastime, after Balaram had killed Pralambasura, and Pralamba had taken Balaram across the Yamuna to Bandiravan. Uh, so the cows, the boys were so happy to get Balaram back and that Balaram had killed the demon that they were playing with such enthusiasm that they didn't notice their cows and also they had goats and buffaloes. They didn't notice their animals, their cows, goats and buffaloes had wandered off. And the cows wandered across the Yamuna and they wandered to the uh, Itchikitavan forest. They kept looking for fresh grass, but when they went into this forest, there were many sharp canes, and they got stuck in the canes. And then a forest fire came, and they were crying to Krishna and Balaram to save them. So then Krishna came and swallowed that fire. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, the fire on the bank of the Jamuna represents controversy between devotees, and the fire in the Yichikatavan forest represents the fire of Kali Yuga and Adharma. So Krishna swallows this fire, and our acharyas say uh, different explanations for who the fire was, but some of our acharyas say that Krishna wanted to eat fire. So some of you perhaps like to eat very spicy food, so you can relate, right? Sometimes we offer Krishna very spicy food, isn't it? Especially if you're from South India. Or I'm sure the devotees in Thailand offer Krishna very spicy food. So Krishna <laughs> likes to sometimes eat fire. So he was enjoying eating this fire. So this fire of material desire that seems impossible to put out. Because it's, it's, as it's explained in the Bhagavatam, the more that you feed this fire, the hotter it burns. We've also had this experience. You know, We have this intense material desire and trying to satisfy it it goes down for a moment, like if I put gasoline in a fire. At first the fire goes down for a moment and then immediately it flares up. So trying to satisfy our desires, we're pacified for a moment and then phew, again. But Krishna can swallow this fire. So when we're chanting the holy name, again, we're with Krishna. We're right with him. And we should be chanting, as Prabhupada said, like a child is calling for its mother. So just like when the cows were in this fire, they were calling, Krishna, moo. Right? And the cowherd boys were also saying, Krishna, Krishna, we're your friends. Please save us from this devastating fire. So when we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, and we we're, we're, have this mood that Krishna, I'm, I'm being swallowed by this fire of my own lust, my own greed, my own envy. Please save me. And Krishna just swallows that fire. I, I think many of us have found that just by chanting Hare Krishna, that many of our material desires just go away. In fact, a lot of our material desires go away without any extra effort at all. Okay, now it's not advancing. So the next part of this first verse of the Sukshastika is that the holy name spreads moonshine on the white lotus of good fortune. Uh, so generally lotuses bloom during the day. Everyone has seen the lotuses are blooming during the day and they close at night. 
But there are some kind of lotuses that bloom at night in the moonshine. So the holy name is compared to a moonshine opening a white lotus of good fortune. So everybody wants fortune in their life. Uh, we would all like, like to have lives full of prosperity. Now, what prosperity means is going to vary from one individual to another. Uh, prosperity is not just about cash, right? There are many people who have a lot of cash but are not happy. You just look at the news for a day and you'll find many accounts of people with plenty of cash and plenty of unhappiness. And then there are also people who don't have a lot of cash and are very happy. Yes, everybody knows of such people. So prosperity is not just cash. Prosperity may be good friends, a loving family, an interesting job, being surrounded by beauty, having good health, having wisdom. Uh, there's so many ways in which one can be prosperous. So good fortune ultimately means, though, not just these things in this world in a temporary sense. Beauty in, the, in a material sense is fleeting, a beautiful house, a lot of cash, name and fame, wisdom. All of these things in this world are very fleeting. But the soul has good fortune eternally. Huh? What is it? Mahatmanas to Mamparta, diving prakriti mashritaha. So when one is spiritually realized, one is under the divine energy. And the divine energy is Lakshmi Devi. <laughs> that is the, the divine energy of the Lord. And as soon as we are under the shelter of Lakshmi Devi, then of course we are full of fortune. Now the moon is a very gentle light. The sun can be intense. Of course, in this part of the world, everybody welcomes the sun. The sun is not usually intense here in Seattle. But no matter where you are in the world, the moon is a very gentle light. So this opening of the lotus of good fortune is done with gentleness and soothing beauty. That is the moon. Isn't that the moon? A very gentle, soothing, beautiful light, kind of like a pearl hanging in the sky. So Krishna is very soft. Actually, Krishna appears in the dynasty of the moon, and he is very, very soft and gentle. Krishna is often compared to a moon, and the different parts of Krishna's body are compared to different moons. Right? The moons of his cheeks, the half moon of his forehead, the moons of his fingernails, and so forth. So again, as soon as we're chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and we're in touch with Krishna, then we feel this soft, beautiful radiance opening up our natural prosperity and good fortune in touch with the internal energy. It seems to have been become disconnected. So. Okay. So the holy name is also compared to the life or the bride, vidya vadu jivanam. Uh, vidya means knowledge, vadu means a bride, jivanam, life. So the life or the bride of all transcendental wisdom. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, when he was uh, in Navadri, he was saying that a house is not a home without a wife. Yes? So, you know, we don't want to be stereotyping genders, but generally speaking, it's the, the woman, the bride, who puts the pretty curtains on the walls and the pictures up and the nice bedspreads on the bed. Generally. And she brings life into the house. So the holy name is like that. The holy name is like this bride that brings life to knowledge. That uh, knowledge without the holy name becomes very dry. One may just simply have some uh, philosophy about the spirit, some philosophy of reality. But the holy name is Krishna. And Krishna is full of life and vitality and youth and beauty. And when Krishna is dancing on our tongue, then all of our wisdom and all of our knowledge is filled with vitality. And just like when the bride comes into the home, uh, she fills it with life. Uh, 
and the holy name increases the ocean of transcendental bliss. Anandam Bhivarinam. And this is a very interesting point that's brought up by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. He says that the ocean can be considered practically unlimited. So here we're very near the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, a huge. And the bliss, as we were saying, perfection is boundless transcendental happiness. The happiness from the holy name is unlimited. And one may ask, how is it that a finite jiva can experience unlimited happiness? And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati says, because Krishna is unlimited, om purnam adha purnamidam, purnat purnat udachate, purnasya purnam adaya, purnam eva vashishtate. You take everything away from him and he still has everything. That is unlimited, right? Unlimited minus unlimited is unlimited. So when we're, un when we're in touch with the unlimited, we can also feel unlimited bliss. So the next part of the shikshastika is that every moment giving one a taste of the nectar of love of God. So, in material life, everybody knows that the greatest happiness in life is for there to be love. Love of something, at least loving your work, or loving your country, or having a dog that loves you when you come home. <laughs> Some, something where there's love. If you don't have love of a spouse or love of a family, you know, love of something, love of a hobby, that if there's no love, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also says that life without love, it's, it's empty and poor. Prema dana mina vyarta dari drajivana dasakori betam amori dasakori bet. I forget the rest of it. Deha prema dana, I think. So he says life without love, it's just useless and poor. And everybody knows this. If you have a lot of money and a lot of fame and a lot of power and you don't love anybody and nobody loves you, what is the value of your life? But the love we have in this world for our spouse, for our parents, for our children, for our siblings, for our country, for our work, for our home, those are all tiny, tiny, tiny parts of God. What does Krishna say? Everything beautiful, opulent in this world is just a spark of my splendor. Imagine how much love we could have for the source. If I could have so much love for my child, or so much love for my work, or so much love for my country, how much love could I have to the source of all that? How fulfilling would that be? How much happiness would I have? And when I'm chanting, I'm in touch with that source. I'm in touch with that source that's the, as Prabhupada would say, the reservoir of all pleasure. Sarvatma, uh, Swapanam, a bath for the self. The self is taking a bath. So, you know, if it's a very hot day and you're working really hard out in the sun, doesn't happen very often here, right? Sometimes in the summer. But any of you who grew up in India, unless you grew up in the Himalayas, right? You know what it's like, isn't it? In the hot season. And if you're outside, and then you go take a bath. It's so refreshing. Maybe you dip in a river like the Ganga, or even if you just go in your home and take a shower or pour a bucket of water on your head. It's just, it's just, ah, oh, what a relief. So the holy name is like that. It cleanses away all of the dirt and the sweat and the grime of our ego, our fears, our anxieties, our striving. 
thinking that I'm going to be happy in this way or that way, and will this person like me and that person like me, and am I going to do well on this, and what's the result of this, and is this going to happen, and is that going to happen? It's all washed away. It's all washed away. We just see that it's all something temporary and external, and it doesn't really touch me at all. I become, in, I become rather in touch with the eternal and the real. So Mahaprabhu's conclusion of this first verse of the Shikshastaka is because of all of these points, the holy name is always victorious. All right, now that we've meditated on each of these, we're just going to listen to the first verse of the Shikshastaka. <laughs> So, questions, comments, discussions? And if you're listening online, you may post a comment online. Yes? How do we get the taste for chanting? Well, of course, that's the next verse of the Shikshastra, <laughs> where Mahaprabhu talks about a taste for chanting. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of devotees speak about this in different ways, so I'm not sure that there's one answer. You know, I've heard many devotees speak about creating a proper atmosphere, having a sankalpa, having a goal in one's chanting. So I, I can really just speak from my own experience. I have a taste for chanting if I'm really chanting in relationship to Krishna. If I'm not chanting as because it's my vow, because it's what I'm supposed to do. You know, if I'm just chanting because, well, I took initiation and I promised Prabhupada I would do it, that, that's something. But it's, it then becomes more of a duty for me. 
or if I'm chanting because, well, I'm supposed to do that if I want prasadam in the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to impress the other devotees or something like that. But if I'm really chanting, this is again speaking for myself. If, if I'm chanting in relation to Krishna, then I feel very, I really get quite a taste for chanting. Of course, like Mahaprabhu was saying, that he doesn't have a taste. So we talked about this a little bit yesterday, that no matter how much one relishes chanting, one always feels that one doesn't have a taste because it's unlimited. Yes? So we think of Rupa Goswami's verse in the uh, Vedakta Madhava, how much nectar is there in these two syllables, Krishna, that when they're dancing in the courtyard of the heart, and we desire many, many years, many, many tongues, the senses become inert. So that kind of taste for chanting is very dependent on, on grace, on mercy of the Lord, the Lord being attracted by our chanting. Like Prabhupada would say, don't try to see God, but act in such a way that he will see you. So Krishna manifests on the, on the tongue and in the heart of the chanter. That's not something that we can control by how we sit or how we pronounce or something like that. It's, it's a loving relationship. But at least if there's a real connection with Krishna, if I'm really uh, meditating when I'm chanting on Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes, then it's when I'm remembering that I'm dealing with a person. That Krishna is naturally very sweet. So as soon as we're dealing with, with Krishna, then our chanting is sweet. Maharaji, what do you mean by sorry? Maharaji, what do you mean by meditating on the name and pastime during chanting? Because normally we are told that whenever we are chanting, we are supposed to speak the Mahamantra and hear it. So, where does the like? How does well, it come? Prabhupada would consistently talk about just hearing the mantra as a second tier. Like he'd say, when you're chanting, you should feel the presence of Krishna. And you, and you remember how Krishna is playing with the Calvary boys, you remember how Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita, and if you can't do that, just hear the name. So ideally you're supposed to like chant, remember, and hear, all three of them? So you're talking to me right now. Yes. And when you're talking to me, you're looking at me, mm -hmm. there's, there's some degree of a relationship you're not just meditating on the sounds of what you're saying. So we're all capable of doing that. You know, if you're talking to somebody that you love, or anyone, you're saying their name. You know, Mr. Smith, Mr. Patel, or you're calling, you know, oh, mother. I mean, you know, you, as soon as you say the name, it's associated with a person. So if, if one is not able to remember Krishna because one hasn't read any of the scriptures, one doesn't know anything about Krishna, then you just hear the sound of the name and Krishna's there and the sound and eventually everything, even if you never studied the scriptures, Jesham Satyajitanam Bajitam Pritipurvakam, the Dhamma Yudhi Yogam Tam Yenam Even if you never studied the scriptures, eventually by just hearing the name, Krishna will be revealed. But for one who's studying the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and Prabhupada says this, uh, he says, if you're chanting and thinking of something material, he said, then it, it's useless. And he pauses. He said, or oh, it will take a long time. He said, why are you reading Krishna book? This was very early. I think this is a lecture in 1970, maybe. He said, why are you reading Krishna book? If when you're chanting, you cannot remember, then it is inattentive chanting. So as soon as you're chanting Hare Krishna, you should immediately remember Krishna's pastimes where he's killing the demons and the cowherd boys are encouraging him with claps, or you remember Krishna's instructions in the Bhagavad Gita. But I think that's, that's natural. It's not a forced thing that I'm going to say, okay, I am going to remember the killing of Palambasura today in my meditation. But it should happen very easily that when we're, when we're chanting about Krishna, then immediately, well, who's Krishna? 
Or like uh, Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say, that you have a picture of Krishna you can look at while you're chanting. If you want to see on, on my website, ramiladevidasi.org, if you look under my seminars handouts, under the handouts for my seminars, I have a seminar on chanting with attention. And in the handouts, there's a series of quotes, of quotes which you would but that, that you can read. So check that out. Thank you. Anybody else? Any more questions? We have a, a book back there on the table on chanting. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, no one question online. So anybody who wants to get a book, we do have a book about chanting Hare Krishna, how to avoid the offenses. Oh, don't sell the little book without the big book. It's a set. No, not that one. The brown one. Don't sell the brown one separately. It comes as a set. So this is the, before you read the question. So we have a book back there on chanting. So if, if you want to read more about, about chanting and chanting with attention, we have this book back there. And those of you who are online, you can get this on Amazon. Also. Or you can come here to the temple after we're not worried about the coronavirus and pick up a copy. Yes? So this question is from Mahalakshmi Mataji. A devotee does not experience the cleaning of the heart facing one's own impurities as something displeasing or unwanted. Does this mean that does this mean that he is due to finding pleasure on the path itself? Yes, definitely. Some people may find it uncomfortable, some people not. You know, much of the cleansing of the heart is a very wonderful thing. But sometimes it may be a little awkward to face one's an artist. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, uh, how do we inspire kids to chant? Sometimes we ourselves. Well, that is another seminar. <laughs> so, I have a seminar on that, inspiring kids to chant. If you go to Iskan Desire Tree and go to my the audio. Iskand Desire Tree, Audio, Mataji's, Ormila Mataji, probably under like seminars or other topics, how to inspire kids in Jampa. Uh, we also have uh, on my website, there's um, on the free educational materials and uh, Touchstone Media is working on, on printing this, but right now it's just online as a PDF. There's a book called Collective Worship and in collective worship, there's a, a two or three pages in that book about how to inspire your kids in job up. But that, that is another seminar. So maybe the next time I come to Seattle, when, we, when we're allowed to fill the room with 200 people instead of worrying about everybody sneezing and coughing, so maybe the devotees want me, we could do that. So. Yeah, we look forward for that, Mataji. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Thank you. So, the beginning of the So, the beginning, uh, we're talking about perfection. And uh, you mentioned that uh, perfection is to see the spiritual self with a pure mind. Yes. And, and it, it means to use spiritual senses in relationship with Krishna. Yes. Uh, but we, our spiritual senses are not manifested right now. It looks oh, like. But that's not exactly the case. Okay. So, the senses I am using right now with this body, they only work because my spiritual senses are there. Hmm. Okay. Just like if you call someone on the telephone. The reason they hear your voice on the other end is you're speaking with your mouth. Mm -hmm. the, the speaker on the other person's telephone will not work if your mouth isn't working. 
So in the same way, our mouth, our gross mouth isn't working unless the subtle mouth is working, and the subtle mouth is not working unless the spiritual mouth is also there. The body is just a machine. Hmm. So it's there, it's just that we're not really interacting with it. Hmm. We're, we're, not, we're not seeing it. Because we don't want to. Because our spiritual senses are all in relationship to Krishna. And the covering creates a false ego. So if we're attached to the false ego, then all we see is the covering. Is that clear? Yes, Mataji. So the follow-up to this, so when we say use the spiritual senses in relationship with Krishna, it's basically engaging all the senses in well, service of Krishna. it starts like that. Hmm. It starts with taking the gross and subtle senses, which is what we're able to understand in the conditioned state, and using those in the service of Krishna in a way that makes sense to us. Hmm. In, in a way that looks something like work in the world. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, we gradually become aware that we have spiritual senses and we are a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. How fast that happens, I mean, Prabhupada says it can happen in a moment, though I see for most people it's not a moment. <laughs> but it does eventually happen that one starts to become aware mm -hmm. as this mirror becomes cleaned Hmm. I mean, I, I like to think of it, you can think of it like a, you know, a foggy mirror in a bathroom. You take a hot shower and the mirror gets foggy. And then it gradually clears. Mm -hmm. You know, at first the mirror is so foggy you really can't see much of anything. Right? And then the mirror starts to clear. And it gets to a point where even if the mirror is not completely clear, you can still see yourself. Or in a car, you know, the window's fogged up and you turn on the defogger. It doesn't have to be completely clear. According to Madhurya Kadambani, our inertis have to be like 40-50% gone. Hmm. So, or you can think of it like if you burned some, something inside of a pot and the bottom is all crusted with burn. then as you're scrubbing the pot, at first you're scrubbing it and you're just working hard, but at a certain point, some of the silver color of the pot shows through. So as we're, as we're chanting and doing service, the, this fog, this dirt is cleared, and we start to see a little bit of our real self. And then that spot <laughs> grows just like the clearness on a foggy mirror or a foggy windshield or a, or a pot. Mm. Okay, yeah. Yes. So thank you, Mataji, for taking the in-depth uh, seminar on the first words of Sister's Compare. So Mataji, my question was on uh, uh, when Krishna describes the hierarchy of our body like senses like sense object senses then mind intelligence false even so why the why the purification krishna also emphasized mostly that man manava man bhakta concentrate so why your purification of the mind not the uh, the intelligence or false ego like uh, what does krishna say when one has conquered the mind the intelligence is already reached Well, he does also talk about purity. He talks about both. Krishna talks about directly purifying the intelligence, talks about buddhi yoga. And he also talks about directly purifying the senses. I just think that he talks about all of them. And sometimes he's emphasizing one and sometimes he's emphasizing another. So it's... It's like if you want to say, well, you're going to clean this room. So often cleaning, we just think about the floor. But if you really were going to clean the room, then you'd have to clean the floor, all the horizontal surfaces. So are we having a Gorpurnima festival here? It looks like that. Are we, are we having a Gorpurnima? I'm just wondering, seeing all the flowers. Yes, we have this one. Oh, we are going to have a festival. It's on. Monday. Monday. Yay. <laughs> 
So if we're talking about cleaning the room, we're talking about cleaning the floor, cleaning the windows, cleaning the window sills, cleaning all the horizontal surfaces, right? But sometimes, but if I'm saying let's clean the room, I might sometimes just be talking about the floor, just be talking about the windows. I, I don't, you know, a particular verse is just Krishna maybe focusing on the mind, a particular verse he's focusing on the intelligence, a particular verse he's focusing on how we're using the senses. So all of them have to be purified. It's not just the mind. And it's an integrated system. You know, our, so when you work on purifying the bodily senses, that tends to affect the mind and the intelligence. And when you work on purifying the mind, it tends to affect the intelligence and the body. And you work on purifying the intelligence, it tends to affect the mind and the body. Right? Yes? If you work on all three at once, that's great. But any, any of them you work on tend to influence the whole system. We have another question coming in. Yes? Hare Krishna Mataji. So, Krishna says that make your mind your friend. Yes. How do I do that? How do we make our mind our friend? It's hard, isn't it? Well, it's like impossible not. Krishna, Arjuna said that. Arjuna said, Chanchala Himana Krishna. He said, I don't know how to control this mind. It's like a tornado. Like a hurricane. How do I control the mind? So there's many techniques given in the scripture for how to control the mind. In Bhagavad Gita 2.64, Krishna talks about being free from attachment and aversion. And that's a technique used in all spiritual disciplines and all yoga systems. Uh, he talks about this also in the 5th chapter, the 13th chapter, where Krishna emphasizes that we're not really doing anything. That we're the observer. And the kind of meditation that's becoming very popular in the world today involves focusing on the mind as an observer. That allowing the mind to observe the thoughts and the feelings that pass through as being non-self. I am observing my thoughts, I am observing my feelings, and I don't have any attachment or aversion to any of them. So this is certainly a technique, and this technique is certainly part of the sadhana in all yoga systems. Another way of making the mind one's friend, Prabhupada talks about, is to be planning for the mission of preaching Krishna consciousness instead of planning for how to increase our own enjoyment in this world. So one of the ways that our mind is our enemy is that it's always planning for how can I increase my enjoyment and decrease my distress. And it, it's constantly doing this. And we can easily analyze any of our thoughts in one of these two categories. You know, oh, I gotta get a better pair of shoes, or I gotta get a better job, or I gotta get a better raise, or I gotta avoid this person, how am I gonna get this person out of my life, how am I gonna get rid of this disease, how am I gonna get rid of this debt, uh, you know. So it's always something like that. Yes? Just if you, if you try for a while, like for even a half an hour or an hour, and just kind of observe your thoughts and you'll see that where the mind goes is, all, is one of these two things. How can I do things to become happier and how can I do things to avoid distress? So this planning of the mind and jumping around to plan can be used to jump around and plan about how to serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Take the same planning instead of how can I make more money and get a bigger car and you know, a fancier house and a higher status job and then everybody will respect me and then I'll be able to buy the new flat screen TV and then I'll be able to take a vacation, you know, in Jamaica. Instead of that, you think, all right, well, how can I help people to learn the Bhagavad Gita? How can I get people to take prasada? You follow? Yes? And there's, uh, we're very, very fortunate that uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us a mission to save the world, not just to save ourselves. And there's unlimited plans we can make to save the world. It's a big world, and there's a lot of problems. There's a lot to save. There's a lot to fix. You, you will not run out of plans and ideas and food for the mind. And another way that we can make the mind our friend is by turning it to Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes. And there's, uh, 
There's things, whatever is happening in our life, can remind, whatever our mind goes to materially, can remind us of something in Krishna's pastimes. Let's say you're having a problem with a family member. Well, Krishna sometimes had problems with family members. He had a lot of problems with Rukmi. Yes? He had uh, problems with uh, Mitravinda's brothers. Then there was the problems between the Pandavas and the Kurus. There's so many stories in the Shastra of Krishna's problems like that. And the Pandavas' problems, the devotees' problems, Dhruva with his stepmother. And you start meditating on that. Right? Or if you're having a problem with money, you meditate on how Arjuna went to get money for the Rajasuya Yagya, that's why he's called Dhananjaya. Right? You're having a problem with somebody uh, taking away your job or your house is in danger and you can meditate on how Bali Maharaj took the demigod's kingdom away and how Vamandev came and tricked them and start taking your mind and your consciousness deep into the Leela. I was talking with someone the other day who was, they were falsely accused of something and they were thrown out of their job and I said, what is there in, in the Shastra you can meditate on? They said, oh, the Pandavas who were exiled. I said, which Pandava would you like to meditate on? I said, I'd like to meditate on Nakul. So we started going deep into how did Nakul feel when he was in exile for 13 years? How did he feel when he was away from his family, away from his kingdom? How did he feel that he had just had this Rajasuya Yagya with Krishna? And, we, and you start going deep into the emotions of the Leela. And that way your mind becomes your friend. And then our mind, instead of meditating on our so-called pastimes, our imitation pastimes, with this and that and the other thing, right? If you're meditating on what car you want to get, you can think of how Krishna calls for his chariot and he takes Arjuna, you know, through the universe and through all the coverings of the universe. And the horses don't want to enter the darkness and then they go to the Brahma Jyoti and start meditating on Krishna's chariot. Or you can even meditate and the Bhagavatam talks about the chariot of the sun god. And, you know, there's so many things, so many places you can take your mind to when your mind starts meditating on things in this world. Another way you can make your mind your friend is through philosophy. Thinking about the philosophy. Uh, meditating on verses, memorizing verses. So we have, I'm supposed to show these books, so we, can, we have this new Bhagavad Gita book which enables you to learn 48 verses in the Bhagavad Gita or to teach them if you have children. It's a nice book to teach children, but it's a nice book to learn the verses yourself. On page six, there's a URL where you can go and, and download audio of all the verses. And we have summaries of the chapters also in the Bhagavad Gita, questions and answers. So you can meditate on the philosophy. Right? I mean, each word Prabhupada said in the scriptures you can meditate on. You can spend your day doing that. Okay. You can also use your mind to meditate on how Krishna says he's in the world, how Krishna says he's the light in all luminous objects, he's the ability in man, he's joining with the air of life to digest our food stuff. He's digesting, he's the fire of digestion. Well, before I came here I had dinner. Okay. So at my, and during dinner, I was eating a cucumber. So what is a cucumber? So it wasn't that long ago that a cucumber was sunlight, right? The plant transformed the sunlight into a cucumber. And then Krishna, as the fire of digestion, takes that cucumber and transforms it into my fingernails. Look at your fingernails and think, well, you know, yesterday that was a japati. <laughs> and some time before that it was sunlight. And the sunlight is just a little reflection of the Brahma Jyoti. And Krishna's digestion, you start meditating how Krishna says he's all these things in the world. Krishna says he's, he's our ability. You know, that sense I have when I'm, I'm moving my hand, I have this ability to move my hand, Krishna says I'm that. Krishna says, I'm your intelligence. I'm the intelligence of the intelligent. 
and we're using our intelligence. That's Krishna. So, so many ways you can make the mind your friend. I'm sure there's more than that. So we have quite a few. Be free from attachment. What did I say? See if I remember. What, see if I can remember. Be free from attachment and aversion. Right? I said that was the next one. I said I did that. Said making plans to spread the mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Said plans for enjoying and suffering in this world. Right? And we can have find something in the Leela we can meditate on. That's take whatever I'm meditating on in the world and find something similar in the Leela and start meditating on that. I can be using my mind to think about philosophy, memorize verses, and I can be using my mind to understand how Krishna is in the world, in my body, and in everything. And again, I'm sure there's more than that. But that's a good start. Yes. Uh, two more questions. All right, and then we're out. And this question is from Srinivas Samaprabhu. <coughs> Would you say something about one having any ego, good ego of the self? Something about one having any ego? Uh, basically, the question is about the true ego. Of the, the true ego. The true ego is Jivara Swell, Kaya Krishna, and Nityadasa. I am Krishna's servant. I am a soul. That is the true ego. I'm a beautiful, wonderful, effulgent, youthful, powerful soul. Insignificant, and yet very significant to Krishna. Krishna is my master, and I'm very proud that Krishna is my master. That is true. I'm the servant of my guru, I'm the servant of Krishna, and I'm a spiritual, eternal being. And then the ultimate true ego is one realizes exactly what is our relationship with Krishna. You know, I'm Krishna's cow, or the flower in Krishna's hand, or I'm Krishna's cow. Or no the second question is from uh, Radha Mataji. Grahastas, grahastha feeling and duties always overtake spiritual practice. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Grahastha feelings and duties always overtake spiritual practice? Always? Is that supposed to be a statement of fact? Okay, if, that, if that's true, then that's a very sad thing. Uh, I think even for ordinary persons, ordinary materialistic persons, that's not true. Ordinary persons are not always 24 hours a day absorbed in their household duties and practice. Sometimes they may be absorbed in something completely different. So just like even ordinary persons, what do they say? The average person in America watches six hours of television a day, which I don't understand that statistic. Like, do they sleep? And average means some people do more. So when people are watching television, they're not doing their grahasta duties. Am I correct? Yes? Generally, there may be some exceptions. Maybe you're teaching your children something in a science show. But generally, when people are watching television, they're trying to forget their duties. They're not doing their duties. So if the average person can spend six hours, so they say, again, I don't know how they get such a high number. Some people maybe use 10 hours. Now, how do they live? I guess they don't cook, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Still, you don't sleep. Why can't I spend some time in sadhana? People are spending time walking in the dog. You know, people are spending their time doing so many things besides just their grahasta duties. So why can't I? I don't think always. But anyway, go on. So the question was, how do I overcome this? How do I overcome this? Well, the first thing I would suggest is to change your language. Language means something. It's powerful. If you're telling yourself that your grahasta duties always overcome your spiritual life, then you're sabotaging yourself immediately. Because even for an ordinary person, their household duties do not always overcome everything else. Ordinary materialistic people take time to do things other than their household duties. People go play sports, yes? They go hang out with their friends. They go to the movies, they watch television. 
They do all kinds of things that aren't related to their household duties. So if they have time for that, we have time for Krishna. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that if you see your household duties as your service to Krishna, then there isn't a question of household duties in Krishna. Bhakti Vinod says, I see my house as belonging to Krishna, and I see my family members as Krishna's servants. So just like in so many temples, there's an ashram. There's like a brahmachari ashram. Some temples have a women's ashram. And then there's a person who's in charge of the temple ashram. And they're, they're making sure that the brahmacharis get fed. They're making sure they have a nice place to sleep, that they have clean drinking water, that their medical needs are taken care of, that they can buy things that they need. One of my duties, after, as soon after I got married, we were still living on the temple facility, we used to do the shopping for the devotees back in the 70s. You know, the devotees who lived in the temple would give their shopping lists and then we would go out and, and buy things for the devotees. So you, if you think of your house as a temple, and if you have an altar in your house, then it really is a temple, and then your house becomes an ashram, a grihasta ashram. And then, you know, you could say the husband is the temple president and the wife is the temple commander and the children are the ashram residents. And you take care of everyone just like somebody would take care of the devotees in the temple. It's not that, you know, well, here is my grahasta life and here is my Krishna consciousness. But to have Krishna consciousness should pervade everything. So if you want to think of it in terms of I have a separate time for sadhana. Uh, I believe that pretty much everybody all the time has some time to be with Krishna. And the other thing is seeing everything in relation to Krishna. So thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank you to those of you who have come tonight. And we do have back here the new Bhagavad Gita book. We have this uh, Krishna conscious novel, How to Go from Materialism to Spiritual Life. And we were an Indie Book Award finalist. And then this book on chanting, and then we just have, I think, three, three copies of this book. But this is Raghunath Das Goswami's Splendid Instructions to the Mind. So any of you who are into how to make your mind your friend, I mean, it is a hefty book. <laughs> this, is, this is not, you know, beach reading. <laughs> but it does have lots and lots of pictures. It has 120 black and white pictures, and here we have uh, color pictures. And also online, I have there's many uh, video classes I've given on this. Uh, so we have all of this back here. I do invite you to get a book, and if you want me to sign one today while I'm here, I'm happy to do that too. Thank you, Shri Prabhupada.